Well, the story of Moana is about a young girl. She's 16 years old. She's the daughter of a chief. She lives on an island where no one has voyaged for a thousand years. In the, the Pacific. In the Pacific. The story takes place 2,000 years ago. And, uh, and she is drawn to the ocean. She is drawn to the sea, even though her father has a rule that no one can ever cross the reef. But through circumstances, she is set on a quest to save her people, to save her island, and she is forced to team up with a somewhat flawed demigod named Maui um, and, and uh, saves the world. One of the th key themes, one of the key themes is identity. It's really finding out who you are. In Moana's case, she has a feeling she should be a uh, navigator like her ancient ancestors, but many things in society are saying, that's not what you should do. We don't go past the islands. We don't do that anymore. Stay here. And so she has this conflict. So the theme is really about listening to your own inner voice and responding to that no matter what the obstacle. And we think it's a great lesson for both young women and young men today. Moana is a true hero. <clears throat> Um, and she's on a true hero's journey, uh, a quest to save her people. She faces numerous obstacles. If she cannot overcome those obstacles, her world will be destroyed. Uh, but she has what it takes, and she, she ultimately um, comes through and discovers who she's meant to be. Well, we heard the expression when we were in the islands, you've got to know your mountain, and your mountain is your, your ancestor, everything that preceded you. If you don't know that, you don't know who you are. And we really wanted a voice in the story that would connect to Moana's past, the past of these ancestors. And this grandmother character evolved as the story developed. She wasn't in the first draft of the movie, but she became her closest confidant. We saw that in the islands, where sometimes kids would have closer relationships with their grandparents than they did with their immediate parents. And it was a very unique and special bond. And we wanted to celebrate that in the movie. And Rachel House, who does the voice of the grandmother, brought such warmth and conviction and passion and empathy. It really helped elevate the whole emotion of the movie. And she really is. The relationship between the two of them is really the emotional core of the movie and as, as it plays out through the course of the story. I mean, Maui is, is from the, the myths of Polynesia. He is a pan-Pacific demigod. His stories are told throughout the Pacific Islands. Many different versions of the stories, uh, although they have some things in common. He, he's, he's a superhero. He, he, he's super strong. He can shapeshift. He has a magical fish hook that's kind of like Thor's hammers with which he can pull up islands. And, um, and in our story, he has, um, he has done something that, and he's actually hasn't turned out kind of the way he hoped. And he, he, was, he was trying to help mankind, but things went horribly wrong. And now, uh, through disrespecting nature, the, the world is in big trouble. And he's and lost only, his fish hook, and so he doesn't have this full complement of power. So he's kind of a diminished demigod. Uh -huh. But, he, but he's trying to sort of fix what he has uh, broken. And through the process, Moana is not only reinvigorating the culture, but she's reinvigorating Maui and getting him to be the hero that he could be. She's sort of charging him up as well as the whole Pacific. It yeah, does, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's kind of a road movie. Kind of fractured relationship. Uh, they don't get along too well in, in the beginning. Maui is a demigod. He doesn't think a lot of humans. Uh, and he's I a mean, bit of an egomaniac. And a, a, braggart and kind of vain and, and, and at, at the same time uh, Moana, um, Maui likes to think of Moana sh that she should somehow be a fan and kind of worship him but she's not and, and, um, mm -hmm. and uh, but they do actually learn a lot from each other and they both grow I think from the in the course of their relationship. Tamatoa is a, a villain in the movie crime, a sub-villain. He's a giant crab and he's very self-possessed and he's sort of anti-theme of the movie. The, the theme of the movie has a lot to about what you are inside, but Tom Atoll is all about surface appearance. He says what only matters is what you look like and he sings a song called Shiny that celebrates sort of his exterior appearance and he's voiced by Jermaine Clement, a wonderful actor from Flight of the Concords and Lynn wrote this great song after having <coughs> binge watched Flight of the Concords and said I'm going to tailor a song for this kind of David Bowie-esque song called Shiny and he's very fun Jermaine ad lib some of the funniest lines in there, and uh, great to work with. The first writer on the project was Taika Waititi. He's a great writer-director. He's done these amazing things. Flight of the Conquerors directed several of those. He wrote the first treatments, the first draft of the script. And he went on to direct What We Do in the Shadows and the next writer. And The Hunt for the Wilder People, actually. And now he's directing Thor. Yes. And then Pam Ribbon came on board. Pam did a wonderful job. She introduced the idea of the grandmother character. 
And we had the Kendall, <coughs> Kendall brothers, uh, yeah. who, who are or both Aaron, Aaron and Jordan. Jordan, who are both from Hawaii. And, and I think they had sailed with Nanoa Thompson, the great uh, Hawaiian navigator. They brought their knowledge of navigation. And they introduced us to the Kakamora. They sort of developed the whole idea of these sort of little coconut clad pirates but, uh, that are kind of after the heart of but, nature. But finally, Jared Bush, who, who, who was a writer, co-director on Zootopia, came onto this movie right after Zootopia. Wonderful, wonderful writer, did, did, a, did a great job. And, uh, and, uh, and really pulled it all together and really the, much of the dialogue you hear in the movie. The funny lines you're hearing are the result of Jared's input. We had a great musical team on this movie. The first person with, that was involved with the music of this movie was Opataya Fawa'i, who is, uh, who is Samoan and, and is part of a group. Um, oh, called, he instigated the group, isn't just part of a group. Yeah. It's his group, Tavaka, wonderful roots music from, the Poly from Polynesia that talks about their culture. Many of the songs are in Samoan or Tov Tokelauan or Tuvaluan, which are, his parents were those things. We also have Mark Mancini, <coughs> who was uh, very involved with The Lion King in terms of pulling together the, the music of, of Elton John with the African influences of Lebo M and is doing a similar thing on this movie. And finally, um, we, we knew in this movie that we wanted to have someone with a musical theater background um, in terms of using songs to tell a story. And about three years ago, we met with a guy named Lynn manuel Miranda, who had done In the Heights for Broadway, um, very enthusiastic, um, very, very, had great ideas, passionate, and, and, um, and, um, and then he, uh, he mentioned briefly that he was involved with uh, something else, another project, a, a hip-hop uh, version of um, the story of Alexander Hamilton for public theater. I don't know whatever happened with that, yeah. but, um, but you not know, not everything, not, everything sure, can, yeah. not everything works out, but yeah. Lynn's done a great Sorry, job yeah, on this yeah. movie. Well, when we visited the islands five years ago, we heard music wherever we went. There was music all across the islands. They had work songs when they were performing tasks. We heard songs of welcome, songs of farewell. Uh, it just radiated all the churches. Of course, after the missionaries came here, every, there's a church every few feet on those islands, and they all sing this beautiful a cappella music. We knew we wanted to have that music in the movie. It's so rich and so powerful. So that was part of the character, and that's what led us to Opataya. But we wanted this, the, the songs to tell a story, too. In all the movies we've done, we don't want and the movie to stop for a song, we want the story to advance. So that's why it was important to get Lynn involved as well. Yeah, we worked with Howard Ashman and Alan Menken uh, on The Little Mermaid uh, in terms of a musical that we did a long time ago. And, and uh, Howard and Alan were, were a brilliant team. And, and Lynn was very, very much inspired by the work of Howard Ashman and, and Alan Menken. Um, and really, and that, yeah, you want the songs to integrate so much into the story. So we tried to get Lynn involved in crafting songs and Opatai as well as early as possible because those were really going to shape the whole spine of the story. John Lester is sort of a, uh, has a mania about research. Any project he does, he feels like it'll work better for the audience if it's founded on something. Even if you depart from reality, know what the reality is, get steeped in that culture. So when we pitched the idea of this movie set in that Arab part of the world, he really said, go deeper, go way, way deeper. So our great development team at the studio set up this three-week visit yeah. to the islands where we this went to Samoa, Fiji, and uh, uh, Tahiti. Tahiti. This was five years ago, a little more yeah. than five years ago And we learned now. so much on, <clears throat> on that trip. It was so inspiring. Uh, many things we didn't know about the hit. We learned about the history of navigation, the culture of navigation, how important it was to the identity of the, of the people in the Pacific Islands. We learned about their connection to the ocean and, and their personal connect connection to the ocean. They talked about it as if it were alive, as if it were a real person. We learned about their connection to their ancestry, to their heritage. We heard this expression, know your mountain, and your mountain is your heritage, your legacy, the people who came before you, everyone who led up to you and who you are. And they said, if you don't know your mountain, you, you really don't know who you are. And, and, and these are ideas that are, are not so thought of as much in, in Western culture, and they were, they were very uh, inspiring to so us. So we really transformed the story when we came back. We kept the character in mind, but the whole story got rebuilt around these ideas that we had learned. We really felt like we owed it to the people that we met in the islands to do something that would reflect their culture and that they would embrace as much as we did. So we felt like this was sort of an, an open window or an open door into their culture that we wanted to share with the world all these things we learned while we were there. Well, well, Ali is interesting because she's so fearless. That was one of the qualities we liked about her. So when she came in red, you know, she was teasing us back. She seemed totally unthrown by this whole completely different world than any world she had entered before. And in a way, that was a little metaphor for what she would deal with with both the movie and with Dwayne, in a sense. And she 
she never blinked and never indicated any sort of hesitancy or reluctance. She dove right in, and that was a very Moana-esque characteristic. Yeah, yeah Dwayne, Dwayne was cast before <clears throat> before Ali E, and, and uh, it wasn't a stretch to cast Dwayne Johnson as, as a demigod. He, he is a demigod in, in, in real life. Um, he has cool tattoos that, that tell his stories, and, and, uh, and he's very, very connected to his, uh, his Samoan roots. He's part Samoan, and, um, and so the character of Maui, I think, um, was, was very natural for him. Plus, he gets to sing in the movie, which he was he was very very, very excited about. about that, yeah. um, so I, I think actually the chemistry between between Maui and Moana and Dwayne and Ali, uh, it's really the heart of the movie, and it's really really fun to watch the two of them together and see their interaction and see how their relationship develops in the course of the movie. Yeah. Hello, it's Valerie here. For all you Harry Potter fans. Did you know that Daniel Radcliffe went through 160 pairs of prop glasses filming the series? Yeah, I swear. For this and more movie facts, click on more videos.